1961, on the first day of training camp, legendary coach Vince Lombardi stood before the Green Bay Packers. He held up a pigskin and he said, gentlemen, this is a football. <laughs> you know, sometimes you need to go back to the basics, don't you? And I think now is the time that Christians need to go back to the basics. Maybe you're one of those Christians like so many that you are truly troubled by what you see going on in our culture. You see values unraveling. You see once held truths being discarded. You're genuinely concerned about what's happening in your nation and your world. And you're wondering, what should we as Christians be doing about it? Should we be organizing 24-hour prayer meetings to pray for our nation? Should we enlist people to vote and get them to the voting booth? Should we hand out evangelistic tracts? What should our response be to the culture in which we live? Well, fortunately, our coach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, told us exactly what we're to be doing right now. And so for the few minutes we have, we're going to go back to the original, this is a football speech. It was given by Jesus Christ himself. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. And in verses 13 and 14 of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus uses two metaphors to describe the reason that he left us here on earth. By the way, have you ever wondered that? Why is it that the moment we were saved, Jesus didn't rapture us to heaven to spend eternity with him? I mean, after all, if Jesus wants to have perfect fellowship with us, couldn't he have better fellowship if we were in heaven instead of left here on earth where we stumble and trip and fall into sin? No, Jesus has a reason he left us here. And he uses two metaphors to describe our purpose as Christians here on earth. In verse 13, he says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Let's talk about salt for a moment. He said, I left you here to be salt. In Jesus' day, salt was a very valuable commodity. Uh, the Greeks thought that salt was divine. Uh, the Romans said there is nothing better than sun and salt. Why was it so important? Well, sometimes salt was used to enhance thirst. In a Middle Eastern country, uh, when people owned livestock to keep them properly hydrated, they would give them salt to eat to make sure that they drank plenty of liquid. Today we do the same thing with our animals. Uh, in Texas we call them football players. In a hot practice we will give our football players salt tablets to make sure they take in plenty of liquid. You've heard the saying, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make him drink, but you can salt the oats. And maybe that's what Jesus had in mind. We are here as Christians to create spiritual thirst in people. And we can do that by our conversation. We can do it with simple something as simple as bowing in a restaurant in prayer, just reminding people that there is a God to whom we're accountable. But the major use of salt in Jesus' day was as a preservative. In the days before refrigeration, salt was used to delay the decay of meat. Now get this, salt could not prevent the decay of meat, but it could delay the decay. It could give meat a longer shelf life before it was thrown out. And I think that's what Jesus has in mind here. He's saying the reason I've left you here in the world is to be a preservative, to slow down the decay of the world. Paul had that idea in mind when he said in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 6 and 7, and you know what restrains him, the Antichrist, now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Who is the he who is restraining evil? 
He is the Holy Spirit of God. And where is the Holy Spirit of God? He is in individual men and women who are believers in Jesus Christ. We, the Holy Spirit in us, we are the restrainer of evils. And one reason God left us here was to push back against evil. Think of it this way. Imagine there's a large dam holding back millions of gallons of water. And there's a little village below that dam. And the townspeople look up one day and they notice the dam is beginning to spring leaks. And the bricks are beginning to crumble. So a group of the townspeople climb up to the dam and they push back on the dam that is starting to spring leaks. Now, they know that their effort is useless ultimately. But what they're trying to do is to prevent the premature destruction of the dam. They want to hold back the flood of water to give the townspeople below time to find a place of safety. And that's what Jesus said we're to be doing. We are pushing back against the evil in our country and the evil in our world. Ultimately, evil is going to prevail during the Great Tribulation. There's going to be a flood of evil, but we're trying to prevent it to give people longer to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, the question is, can we really delay the destruction of this nation and the world? Doesn't God have those things indelibly written on his calendar? Well, let's see what the Bible says about that. Now, I believe in the sovereignty of God. I strongly believe in the sovereignty of God, but I also believe in our responsibility to obey God's commands. And one person obeying God's command can push back against evil. Just think about Jonah, for example. God said, I am going to destroy the wicked city of Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. But then Noah, or pardon me, Jonah began preaching and people started turning back to God. And Jonah 3.10 says, when God saw their deeds that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he declared he would bring upon them and he did not do it. Because of Jonah's faithfulness, God delayed his destruction of Nineveh. Now, we know from secular history in 612, uh, God actually did destroy Nineveh. But he delayed the destruction, giving people time to repent. And ladies and gentlemen, that's our function as Christians, to be salt, to push back against evil, to give people longer to trust in Christ as Savior. Now, some people don't understand that. They think as Christians we're supposed to isolate ourselves from the culture, to get in our holy huddles and just try to keep bad things from happening to one another. Look, for salt to become effective, it's got to get out of the salt shaker and it's got to penetrate the meat. We've got to get out of our churches and get into the culture and influence the culture. God didn't call us to isolate ourselves from the culture. He sure didn't call us to identify and become like the culture. Jesus said if we become like the culture, we're worthless salt that is to be thrown out and trampled upon. No, the reason God left us here is to influence the culture. How do we influence the culture for good and for righteousness? Well, we can do it in the workplace when we stand up against ungodly principles. I have a nurse in my church right now who's in the national headlines because she worked for CVS and she refused to prescribe abortion-inducing uh, uh, tablets and she is fired and she's suing because of that. Good for her. We live in a country where we believe in the free exercise of faith. But she said, no, I'm not going to do what God has said no to. We can do it. We can stand up against evil when we go to a school board meeting and say we're not going to have this godless transgender agenda crammed down the throats of our students. We're saying no or we're going to fire you and put you out on your ear. We need to do that. We need to stand up against evil. And we do it, by the way, in the voting booth. That's one reason way we push back against evil. Now, we've got Republicans, we've got Democrats, we've got independents watching this broadcast. God bless every one of you. This isn't a partisan broadcast, but this is an absolute fact. The reason Roe v. Wade 
which resulted in the slaughter of 60 million babies in the womb. The reason it is no more is because Christians got together and they elected a leader who said, I will put three Supreme Court justices on who will overturn Roe v. Wade. That's what happened and it made a difference. Christians can make a difference where they are. That's what God has called us to do. What happens when Christians fail to be salt? What happens? All we have to do is look 83 years ago at what happened in Germany when Adolf Hitler rose to power, invaded Poland, and threatened to take over the world. Six million Jews were exterminated because of Adolf Hitler. And why was Hitler able to rise to power? It wasn't because of non-Christians. It was because of Christians. German Christians who remained silent in the face of evil. My friend Eric McTaxis writes about it, talks about it often. The fact is German Christians found a reason not to get involved in the culture. They said, oh, that's not our job. We shouldn't get involved in politics. Or that's the providence, the sovereignty of God. We're just going to preach the gospel. And when good men do nothing, evil triumphs. Erwin Leitzer, my friend recounts a testimony from a Christian living in Germany about the end result of indifference during the Holocaust. This woman wrote, I lived in Germany during the Nazi Holocaust. I considered myself a Christian. We heard stories of what was happening to the Jews, but we tried to distance ourselves from it because what could anyone do to stop it? A railroad track ran behind our small church. And each Sunday morning we could hear the whistle in the distance and then the wheels coming over the tracks. We became disturbed when we heard the cries coming from the train as it passed by. We realized it was carrying Jews like cattle in the cars. Week after week the whistle would blow. We dreaded to hear the sound of those wheels because we knew we would hear the cries of the Jews en route to the death camp. Their screams tormented us. We knew the time the train was coming, and when we heard the whistle blow, we began singing hymns. By the time the train came past our church, we were singing at the top of our voices. If we heard the screams, we sang more loudly, and soon we heard them no more. Years have passed, and no one talks about it anymore. But I can still hear that train whistle in my sleep. God forgive me. God forgive all of us who called ourselves Christians, yet did nothing to intervene. Ladies and gentlemen, we can be silent no longer. It is time for God's people to stand up, to speak out, and to push back against the evil that is in our world today. That's what Jesus meant when he said, you are the salt of the earth. If we don't do it, if we don't stand up, speak out and push back, who in the world is going to do it? But there's a reason we're to be salt. The reason we're pushing back, the reason we're preventing the premature destruction of the world is so that we can do that second thing Jesus commanded, and that is to be light. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. Light. Now, this is going to make some of you mad. That's okay because I'm getting on a plane soon and going back to Dallas. And I'll let Cornerstone deal with the mess here. Ladies and gentlemen, we as Christians are not called to save America. That is not the mission of the church of Jesus Christ. We are not called to save America. As Christians, we are called to save Americans from the coming judgment of God by introducing them to faith in Jesus Christ. That is what our calling is. America is ultimately going to collapse. You know how I know that? Because I preach through the book of Revelation often and America is not mentioned one time in the book of Revelation. The last government formed for the last seven years of Earth's history during the tribulation will be a ten-nation confederacy. There'll be no freedom of speech, no freedom of commerce, no freedom of religion. 
That means America will have ceased to exist. There'll be no more constitution in effect. We're not called to save America. We are called to save Americans from the coming judgment of God by introducing people to faith in Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus said, you are the light of the world. We don't generate light, we reflect light. And that's why I'm so excited about what Cornerstone Network is doing. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, they are shining the light of Jesus Christ, bringing people to a saving relationship with Him. The only way we're going to change the direction of America is by changing the hearts of Americans, and only Christ can do that. Now, some of you are probably thinking, oh, pastor, that's just too out of date. People are not open to the gospel anymore. There is just no way we can still be involved in evangelism. Don't you read the websites and know how dark this world is? I know how dark this world is. As dark as it is, it is not nearly as dark as when the Apostle Paul ministered and wrote. You remember when Paul was um, writing in the book of Philippians, 19 different times he said, Rejoice in the Lord. Again I say, rejoice. And when Paul wrote those words, he wasn't sitting on the French Riviera sipping a pina colada. <laughs> he was in prison facing what could have been his execution. When he wrote the, the Philippians, you know who the emperor was? The leader of the world? His name was Nero, the most evil Roman emperor in history. He is the one who would take Christians, dip them in hot wax and set them on fire alive to light his gardens. Now that's what you call evil and darkness. And yet Paul said, I rejoice. He said, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the progress of the gospel. Paul was excited because he was having more opportunities to share the gospel than ever before. And then he said in chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, And as for you, Philippian Christians, I want you to be children of light in the midst of this perverse and crooked generation, holding forth the word of life. Now you have to ask yourself, was Paul smoking something? I mean, why in the world would he get excited about the darkness of the world? Because he understood a basic principle. And that is, the darker the background, the brighter the light. The darker the background, the brighter the light. You know, I had to learn that lesson the hard way a few years ago. One day my youngest daughter came in to me and uh, talked to me and she said uh, she had made a particular decision and I was so excited about that decision. I said, I said, honey, I'm going to take you to the mall and buy you whatever you want. I guess I can go ahead and tell you what the decision was. She had decided to work, break up with her boyfriend. The most worthless excuse for a boyfriend any parent could possibly imagine. I bet some of you can relate to that. I'd been praying, oh, Lord, put an end to this, put an end to this. And finally she came in and said she had. I said, praise the Lord. And in a moment of insanity, I said, I'll take you to the mall and buy you whatever you want. Now, what I had in mind was, was going to our local mall there in Dallas and going to a, a store called Forever 21 where they had on sale $20 and $30 dresses. I thought I'd buy a $30 dress and wouldn't call it a, what, a day. That's not what my daughter had in mind. The next day she took me to the mall and she walked me right past Forever 21 and into a jewelry store. The most expensive jewelry store in Dallas. And I walked through there and I just started getting the shakes just walking in there. We walk up to the counter and in a few moments the salesman appears. He looks at my daughter and says, good to see you again. I thought, again, oh my, I've been had. He said, would you like to look at that ring you were looking at yesterday? She said, yes. And now I really begin to get the shakes. The salesman disappears. He comes back holding the ring box. But before he opens that ring box, he takes a piece of black felt and places it on top of the plexiglass counter. And once he has that black felt background, 
He opens that ring box and plops the ring right in the middle of that black felt. And the contrast between the darkness of that background and the brightness of that ring, it almost was enough to blind me to the price of the ring. Not quite, but almost. <laughs> but you know, he was an expert salesman. He understood that principle. The darker the background, the brighter the light. Ladies and gentlemen, we are living in some dark days right now. If your goal in life is peace, prosperity, pleasure, the avoidance of pain, these are terrifying days in which to live. But if, like the Apostle Paul, your goal in life is to share the message of Christ yes. with as many people as possible, yes. there has never been a better time to be alive and be a Christian than right now. Because as this world gets darker and darker and darker, the brightness of the gospel shines more brightly than ever before. Amen. The darker the background, the brighter the light. And that is why this is a great time to invest in Cornerstone Television Network. This is an organization that is spreading the light of Jesus Christ to the darkest parts of our world. And the best thing you can do right now is to partner with them and whatever time we have left before Christ returns to share the gospel with as many people as possible as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Now some of you have been listening to this message and you've said, Pastor, this is the most schizophrenic message I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> You're confusing me. What exactly am I to be doing? Am I to be pushing back against evil? Is that what I'm supposed to do? Or I'm supposed to share the gospel with as many people as possible. Well, what did Jesus say? Did he say you can be salt if that's your thing? But if you're not comfortable doing that, you can be light? No, it's not either or. It's both and. Jesus said we're to do both things. Push back against evil. Take a stand. But remember to share the gospel with others. If we're going to be obedient disciples of Christ, we've got to learn how to multitask. The church of Jesus Christ has to be balanced, not doing one or the other, but both things. But ladies and gentlemen, when I say we are to be balanced, don't make the mistake of equating balance with passive. This is no time for Christians to be passive. I think of the words of William Watkins in his book, The New Tolerance, in which he said, it's time for Christians to reject the new tolerance and instead become a people marked by intolerance. Not an intolerance that unleashes hate upon people, but an intolerance that is unwilling to allow error to masquerade as truth any longer. An intolerance that is willing to stand up and call good, good, and evil, evil. Mm -hmm. May God give us the courage to do just that. May we pray together. Father, thank you for saving us. But thank you also for selecting us to be a part of your kingdom enterprise. Give us the courage to stand up and push back against evil. But also give us the power and the ability to share the gospel of Christ with as many people as possible. He is our only hope. And we pray for your continued blessing on the Cornerstone Television Network, that this network would continue to reach millions with our only hope, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.